I'm having to reset the iron because Rex retracts his irons I'm like a wuss. Yeah, because I know how to take care of my tools. This is set up like a smoothing plane, which is how you want your four planes. Which is, you know, it's that way because I wasn't using it. Yeah. Cut against the grain. People think it's difficult. I don't know why I'm sitting like I'm going to prom or something. You know that's staying in, right? All right. Austin, what do you do for a living? Uh, I'm a kitchen and bath remodeling contractor. <laughs> Clearly, that's not why you're here today. Oh. <laughs> I've seen the bathroom. Although, Are you sure? I mean, the <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I can afford a I, remodel on that nightmare I have going in there. I haven't, uh, I haven't had the gumption to actually use that <laughs> thing. But. So I started making planes because I, frankly, I couldn't afford to buy modern planes. And I thought they were so cool. There's something about the new, fresh beach that's just fascinating. Thinking that all of those old planes likely looked like this at some point, and then someone made their living with them, and now they look like they do, and then their grandchildren abused them, you know? But I, I knew Caleb James, really. He was probably the, the biggest influence for me. Um, most people know him for spokeshaves, but he started out with uh, chairs and planes. And he was the one that was kind of, encouraging to just try it just try making a plane and so i tried making some planes and then i had a lot of fun with it and then i made some other planes and i started out making the laminated planes that everybody makes and i just thought this is kind of a cop-out like i what like surely like there are literally millions of one-piece planes out there that are user made are factory made it's just like the way that planes were made so one of the big differences you might notice on these planes is the tote. And this is an older uh, New York factory made plane and probably middle to second half of the 1800s. And by then, uh, most of the plane makers had switched to a centered tote, which is universal, obviously left handed or right handed. And this plane has an offset tote. So this is for a right handed user. There really isn't any, I suppose you could use it as a lefty, but it's not going to be very comfortable. The other stark difference is the, the size and the height of the totes. And this plane is made for a two finger grip. So you're going to use your middle and your ring finger to grip the plane and your Spider-Man grip it. This plane is made as a three finger grip. I have a hard time even doing it. I'm so used to doing the two finger grip. But with the centered tote, your pinky is uncomfortably far over. This plane is really made to be held like this. It has some ergonomic differences in the way that you grip it. It also has some real differences in the way that the plane wants to balance. It's amazing how much easier it is to keep a plane square when you're working on the edge with this pinky down here anchoring and taking the lateral forces of the plane. With this, it's all wrist. There's, there's no feedback in in this bottom part of the hand as to what the plane is doing um, on an angle. So probably this just takes more skill to use and I don't have it. So this is a number five. Everybody's familiar with this, the Bailey pattern. Um, jack plane, right? Four plane, jack plane. What's the difference? There is no difference, except how the blade's sharpened and how you use it. So you could make this a four plane if you ground the iron with the severe camber that this plane has. But this plane is for coarse stock removal, and this plane is set up for finer work. This is intermediate, right? This isn't your super finely set smoothing plane. This is an intermediate tool. This is going to do uh, general smoothing work in compliant woods. It also is great for basic edge jointing work. It has a long enough sole to be able to joint uh, Small scale furniture size pieces. If you're not building dining tables and workbenches all the time, you're not going to use a joiner plane like this. This is ridiculous. It's longer than the board that I'm edge jointing. Why would you need that? You don't need it. You need this and this. At least that's what Rex says. So I have to say it because I'm in his shop. Do I agree? You'll never know. 
I'm here. I'm paid big money to say Rex is right. Follow his instructions. Subscribe. Give more money on Patreon. Just donate in general. You know. So how was that, Rex? Was that, that good? Was, that was fantastic. Does this look familiar? It should. It looks just like this. That's right. Rex killed a perfectly bad old plane and saved its guts so that we could demonstrate for you today exactly how the inside geometry of a wooden plane works. Here's the bed. Here's the where. Wait, what's the bed? I'll get there. Okay. Here's the bed. Here's the where. Here's the escapement. Here's the eyes. Here's the abutment. Okay. So that was a lot of words, and I didn't explain any of them. So now I'm going to. The bed is where the iron sits. So if this is the plane iron, it's sitting here. The wedge of the plane fits against the, um, against the plane iron underneath of the abutments. The wear is this angle that's just slightly steeper than the bed angle. And this is so that as the plane sole wears out and the plane sole is flattened, the mouth doesn't open rapidly. If it were at a counter angle the way that the escapement is here, that every time some amount of material is removed from the bottom sole of the plane, that mouth would open faster and faster and faster, and you would have this huge gaping mouth in no time. The wear helps to prevent that. People think it's difficult to set up a wooden plane. So what I'm going to do here is film a uh, tutorial video on how to install the iron and the wedge. First, you install the iron. And then on this plane, you actually have to install both at the same time. But and I know that because I made it. You install the iron, then you install the wedge, then you set the wedge, and then you work. And it's a little bit, uh, it's a little light, a little bit of a kind of thin shaving, which is not what we want for a four plane. Because we have work to do. Remember that. And now I can just keep planing and just completely remove Rex's board from the face of this planet. Well, until I hit the planing stop. And that's still kind of, you know, you could even go coarser. Remember, this is a four plane. It's like a hatchet stuck in a body of wood. Austin, Austin, that's, that's way too heavy of a cut, man. How do you back that off? Um, so yeah, so to back it off, you hit this here, and then you reset the wedge. And now I'm taking a finer shaving. A really fine shaving. Well, so I don't know if you just saw that. But if you did, where I took a pass and no shaving happened, don't be deceived into thinking that the plane was set too fine. What's actually happening is the board is undulated. So it's got waves in it because the iron is curved. So when that took that one pass, I found a spot where I was sitting on two high points and my now slightly retracted iron was riding in that gullet and I wasn't contacting anything. If I simply move over a quarter of an inch, I'll take off the high spot. So now I have a, a gullet here, come to the edge, there. Now this board is very compliant. It's a nice straight grain piece of pine. This not be such a compliant board. It's got lots of knots in it. With a plane like this, um, Say you're working to a line, and I'm in Rex's shop, because so I don't know where a single thing is, so I'm going to use this pencil. But say you're working to a line, right, on the edge of the board. What you have to really watch for, see, I don't know where it goes back to. What you got to watch out for is, is tear out. And that's really the deepest part of your cut when you're using a coarse plane. When you're working with a coarse plane and a board that isn't compliant, it's got knots or reversing grain, and you're working to a pencil line or a marking gauge line, the tear out is really the deepest part of your cut. So we say, use the coarsest tool for as long as possible. Well, sometimes as long as possible is a lot shorter than you'd like. And in this case, it would be. If we, did, if we wanted to make sure that this knot got cleaned up and we didn't have any tear out around it before we got to our gauge line, we have to look at how deep the tear out is 
as we're planing and gauge how close are we to the final depth of the board. And at some point, we'll have to suffer and switch over to an iron plane. And we'll just take these fine, wispy shavings for the next two or three hours. Just go into town with our super heavy metal plane. Buy wooden planes today. So Rex really liked this strike button. And he really doesn't like strike buttons like this. And I don't have a lathe. So the answer is a tall, large strike button that isn't round. And that's how we came up with this here diamond, which is actually just a square turned sideways. Don't tell Rex. He thinks it's a diamond. So strike buttons are how we retract the plane as we saw earlier. And without strike buttons, you would beat the crap out of your plane. So strike buttons, that's pretty much it. This isn't really like a debate. This is just, the answer is strike buttons. Now, uh, when I first started using wooden planes, I hit the back of the plane to retract the iron. And over time, I found out that that was way less effective than the strike button, but I don't know why. Yeah, so it's, it's very uh, simple, yet very odd. Basically, what happens when you hit this strike button is that um, you're driving the body of the plane in a downward direction. And the iron, because it's technically a separate piece, doesn't want to go with the plane. It wants to stay where it is in space. So when you hit this, and you shock that plane body downward, the plane iron wants to stay. So you're not really retracting the iron as much as you are advancing the body of the plane. Think about that for a minute. So Austin, this isn't like your main occupation. You do remodeling work professionally, but um, if somebody wants to get one of these from you, they can, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what should somebody know about price and about how the discussion goes if they approach a tool maker? Um, probably one of the most important things is to recognize that these take quite a bit of time to make well. You can make a plane quickly, but to make them in a saleable version, they do take a fair amount of time. It takes some specialized tooling. It takes uh, driving yourself insane trying to find European beach. Why can't you use American beach? Uh, you can. It's not super easy to find it either, and most of it's spalted when you do find it. So finding really clean uh, and quarter sawn, ray flex, beach, very difficult. And then you have the conundrum of irons, which uh, Dan over at Red Rose Reproductions has solved that problem for everybody. In finally, someone is uh, selling at retail tapered plane irons for traditional planes, and he even sells double iron plane, uh, plane irons. The taper being the important thing that you can't get from anybody else that sells plain irons. Yeah, so why is the taper so important? Because it counteracts the taper of the wedge, which makes the plane easier to adjust because when you're driving the iron down, you're actually making the thinner part of the iron contact the, the wedge. So it's very easy to make the cut deeper. And it also holds it set very well because the force of pushing the blade back up is wedging against this rather than a parallel iron just trying to be crushed in between something. It, basically, you're, with a parallel iron, you're trying to use this like a clamp. With this, it's two counteracting wedges. Yeah. Um, I, I like the, the tapered iron. I have some wooden planes, even some nice wooden planes with parallel untapered irons. And the difference in adjustability is huge. Oh, yeah. These adjust so much better. I would not buy another plane, another wooden plane that way. Now, if somebody approaches you and they want one of these planes, like if, if they want this plane, you've got a price, right? Yeah. So this currently is $400 for a uh, four plane double iron uh, with a strike button. And again, I will talk anybody out of getting a plane without a strike button. Yeah. You know, and I've bought, um, I don't show them on camera a lot, but I've bought several planes from small plane makers uh, because I really want to support them. And I also love using the tools in my work. 
Uh, I try to focus on affordability around here. So I don't show expensive tools that often. But if you want to approach somebody and have one of these tools made, all the plane makers I know, you know, deliver their tools in a timely fashion and do great work. But the one thing I would say to anybody is it's not a negotiation. You know, uh, these tools are extremely time intensive to make and nobody's going to be mad at you if you don't like their price. If they say my plane's 400 or 450 and you say, oh, that's a little more than I had in mind, no one will mind. But I think a lot of makers, and I felt this way when I was building custom furniture, I would quote a client a price and then they would try to get a lower price and I would have to say like, no, that's the price. Right. You can take it or leave it and no hard feelings, but we're not negotiating. That's that's the cost of the materials plus my time. Right. So I know you make a lot of wooden tools. Yeah. Why haven't you made a traditional abutted plane? So a, a couple of things. Um, I'm like pretty much a self-taught woodworker, and this isn't something I want to get into just by reading books and watching videos and then trying to do it. I think I'm going to uh, waste a lot of time that I could spend doing things I know how to do or making videos that people want to watch. So I would want to study it with somebody. <laughs> Luckily, now I know somebody, so you know maybe we can do that. I also have the impression that when you go to make planes like this, you have to make a handful of them before you really get it dialed in. That doesn't make sense for me as a content creator. Nobody wants to see five videos of me learning. Okay, not enough people <laughs> want to see five videos of me learning how to become a plane maker. How many of these did you make before you got good at it? Um, probably a half a dozen or so. I mean, the first plane is perfectly serviceable. Um, it's just not saleable. Yeah, I would say I mean, anything's saleable, right? right but right. like, it's not really a market product. Um, the plane works fine. The mouth is too big, but it was a four plane, so it doesn't matter. And if you're wanting to get into plane making, I would say don't make a smoothing plane as your first plane, or don't make even a tri plane as your first plane. Start with a with a four plane. The mouth could be a half an inch wide, and the plane is still going to function just fine. Yeah. Um, I feel like we should tell people how you and I even know each other. Uh, yeah, I don't. What, let's. So it's the forum. Yeah. So, so we, yeah. I mean, you, this is going to turn into a Patreon commercial, yeah, but it just true. it is what it is. Um, Austin is in my Patreon group, and we have a discussion forum online. It's really good. It's got a couple thousand members, and he did a build along tutorial where he didn't just show the process. But he explained where some of the popular books and articles maybe aren't as clear as they could be. And he set people straight on a bunch of stuff. And he finished the plane. And I was like, yes, I need one of those. I'm going to buy one of those. And I just messaged him. And then a little while later, we were like, wait, we live like 20 miles apart. Yeah. I had, you know, most of the people on the forum live around the country or around the world. And we're neighbors, which was hilarious. Yeah. So um, that's how I ended up doing it. And Austin's really active on the forum. Yeah. It's a. Honestly, it's kind of the only place that I spend time on the internet. It's I, the only woodworking forum I'm on. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just it's the truth. It's a lot of great people, and I, I think that uh, being behind the Patreon wall really weeds out uh, people that aren't serious about what they're doing and serious about being encouraging of the other people that are on the forum. Like we, we just don't have those people on the forum. They're also serious about being polite yeah. and just, just having manners and like, nobody's just, mean, just don't, uh, don't say it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, and people are, they're really good about that. Um, Austin, this has been really amazing. Thank you. Oh, uh, patreon.com slash Rex Kruger. If you want to get in on that, um, Austin is what's the best way to find you. Um, you can email me at save the electrons at gmail.com if wow. you're interested in a in a plane. Wow, public email drop. Yeah. That that was a bold move. Yeah, I, just, I wouldn't do that. I'll delete the email address if, okay. you, <laughs> if you guys spam me too much. Austin, thanks a bunch. Yeah, no See problem. See you soon. Yeah, you too. If you're not building dining tables and workbenches all the time, you're not gonna use a that was the, the cut sequence where you hand where that plane appears in my hands. Which plane? The one behind you. Oh. Yeah, we can do that. There. Here's your special effects. Join our plane like this. <laughs>